Welcome to the SafeCode e-learning course on cross-site scripting, or XSS. The objectives of this course are to help you understand the core concepts behind cross-site scripting, or XSS, what it is and why it's important to avoid it in your applications. Recognize how and where in your web application you may expect to find cross-site scripting. Learn how to deploy strategies for preventing and remediating cross-site scripting. The primary intended audiences for this course are architects, developers, and testers of web applications who are not familiar or may be only slightly familiar with cross-site scripting. Development managers and people handling priorities and deferrals will also benefit from this material. Here is what we'll cover in this course. First, we'll show by illustration what cross-site scripting is, why it's bad, and how it's accomplished. We'll then point out the prerequisites leading to cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and examine some solutions for effectively preventing cross-site scripting exploits, along with identifying tactics that don't work. We'll also provide helpful implementation hints and warn you about common pitfalls. In order to explain cross-site scripting, let's first back up and imagine a different sort of vulnerability. Imagine what you could do if you could break into a web server and upload your own HTML files. Say you found a way to break into a company's FTP server and you could upload as many new HTML files as you wanted. What sorts of things could you do if you had the power over somebody's web server? Well, you could do things like phishing, which is persuading humans to do something. You could put up forms and other documents on somebody else's website. And then you could point to those forms and persuade people that the information came from that organization. You'd be able to create a fake login form and trick people into using it. You'd also be able to do things that don't involve persuading any people, things that are completely automated attacks. You could add malicious JavaScript to pages that could steal users' login credentials or eavesdrop on all of their keystrokes and send them back to your cell. You could also do simple things like deface websites of organizations you dislike. You could cause a website to offer its users malicious executables that seem to be coming from that website. The sky is really the limit. You name it, you can probably do it. If you don't remember the specifics just mentioned, if just in general you remember that if you break into a web server and have the ability to upload some HTML files, that's bad enough. And there are a lot more bad things that can happen from that. Keeping in mind that bad things happen if I can get the ability to upload HTML to somebody else's web server without permission, what if there are ways to do that that don't involve breaking into the server? I'll first point out that the web servers repeat back the things you say to them constantly. Sometimes they repeat it right away. If you do a search on a search engine for repeat after me, the search engine probably responds back, sorry, no search results for repeat after me. That's HTML in the output that you dictated by controlling the input. Here, for example, is a screenshot of a Google search. Now, if you look in the URL, you can see the name value pair Q equals repeat after me. And so that thing that's in the link, which is part of the input, ends up in the output. It appears two times in the output. It appears in that blank, and it appears in your search, repeat after me, do not match any documents. We can make a link of Google search results and then send that link to somebody else, which causes them to run the same Google search, and they can then see the same output that you did. An attacker can do likewise with malicious content if the web application allows. At other times, you'll say things to web servers that they repeat much later. If you leave a comment on a blog or a news article, the web server stores that comment and plays the HTML back to other people later. Or if you set up a profile on a social networking site, for example. In any case, the input that you provide to the web server often doesn't just get repeated back to you. It gets repeated to anybody else that you can send that link to. Here's an example of a website that does not immediately reflect back the user input but stores it and subsequently serves it to any visitor. This screenshot shows a web form where the user, Tom, can change his personal data. After Tom has filled out all the form fields, he clicks on Update Profile, and the data is stored in the web application's database. 
Now, when another user, for example, Tom's supervisor, Jerry, opens Tom's profile, this exact data is served to Jerry. This is expected behavior, and there's no harm in that yet. To put it another way, we already mentioned that if you can upload your own HTML, you could perform an attack. But do you really need an entire file to do that? Or could you do it just with a little bit of HTML in some existing file? Well, it turns out, thanks especially to tags like iframe and script in HTML, you really only need to inject a small amount of HTML to get a lot done. So far in all of these examples, the input has been nice and friendly and hasn't tried to include any HTML tags. But what if it did? The next question to ask is, will it repeat arbitrary HTML back to me? In this screenshot, Tom entered not just expected characters, but included a few HTML tags to format the street number as italic and the street name as bold. The browser of Jerry now does not show the exact input of Tom, but interprets the HTML tags to do the formatting. Again, this is not very harmful yet. But now that Tom knows that the web application interprets his HTML tags instead of showing the exact entered text, he can use this circumstance to do more harmful things by including JavaScript tags and making Jerry's browser execute Tom's malicious code. In this screenshot, the code merely opens an annoying message box, but nothing could stop Tom now from altering the malicious JavaScript to steal Jerry's session or make Jerry's browser download a malicious executable. Let's stop here and talk a little bit more about that dialogue in the context of testing for cross-site scripting. Take this script alert XSS, or script alert document dot cookie, or script alert foobar. It's not that such a dialogue in and of itself has done anything terribly wrong. It's a placeholder that proves something very bad could happen. For example, when people test physical security systems, they don't bring real bombs into secured areas. If they are able to penetrate into a secure area of the building, they might just leave a slip of paper that says, I was here, and that proves they broke the security of the environment and got to where they were not supposed to go. Likewise, when we show cross-site scripting exploits that just put up a dialogue that says XSS or blah blah, it's not that the dialogue is actually an exploit. What's important is that Dialog proves that we successfully injected a script tag, and we know that if we can inject that script tag, we could have injected any script. That XSS Dialog is just a safe placeholder to demonstrate that something very, very bad could have happened. What we've seen so far is that there are several kinds of cross-site scripting. The more common of them are stored XSS and reflected XSS. For the stored XSS, Web applications that allow users to store data are potentially exposed to this type of attack. The attacker will enter malicious JavaScript or HTML code in an input field present on the page. And if the server doesn't validate the input, the server will store this code in its database. When the information is requested by the victim afterwards, the server will send the code and the browser will execute it. We've seen this attack earlier in the user profile example. Another example of this type of attack will be in a discussion forum. The user can enter whatever he wants to in his new post. The web server will store the post in the database. When a user browses for posts, the malicious post will be retrieved, and the malicious code will get executed if there are no countermeasures. Reflected XSS works a little differently. In this case, the user is tricked into clicking on a malicious link or into submitting a crafted form to inject code into the web server. There are many ways in which users can be tricked, for example, via an email or by social engineering tricks. The injected code will be reflected off the web server by including it in the response, and the browser will execute the injected code. The injected code can be reflected in an error message, a search result, or in any response that includes part of the input sent. An example of this kind of attack is to click on a URL that contains a parameter. The requested page will display the contents of the parameter. The attacker could send a malicious script as a parameter, and it will get executed when the browser loads the page. A less often seen but similarly dangerous kind of cross-site scripting is DOM-based. 
DOM-based XSS differs from stored and reflected XSS in that the attack targets vulnerable client-side JavaScript. As a result, the web server never sees the malicious injected code or has a chance to neutralize it. The effects of DOM-based XSS are the same, however. A successful attack could still steal login credentials or trick the victim into downloading malware, etc. And it's really that simple. The impact is similar to somebody breaking into your FTP server and uploading their own HTML. That's particularly true for cases of stored cross-site scripting. For example, let's say that I typed HTML into my post into a user-to-user -user forum. If the forum site served that HTML back to other people, then that's a great way for me to publish my HTML to everybody else who reads that user forum. Reflected and DOM-based cross-site scripting take a little more finesse for an attacker in the real world to lure someone to that link. But for your purposes, you don't need finesse. You just need to file bugs. Once you understand the concept of cross-site scripting, the way to test for it is pretty straightforward. You just look for the repeat-after-me pattern in the product you're testing. The repeat-after-me doesn't always happen right away. Sometimes you type input in somewhere, and it comes out as output much later to a different user, or maybe even just to an administrator who reads a log file or who browses all the files of all the user accounts on the system. It's also not always as simple as just typing in less than script greater than. Sometimes you need extra things. Sometimes quotation marks or apostrophes or backslashes or things that close HTML comments are required in order to make it work. Sometimes you don't inject any less thans or greater thans at all. Sometimes all you need to do is inject something like on load alert equals XSS. It depends. And it's not always in the URL. That is, it's not always necessarily the result of a GET request. Parameters sent via HTTP post are just as liable to be repeat after me as something that comes from a GET. Fortunately, you don't need to remember an exhaustive list of attack patterns when developing your web application, since we will use a better strategy than trying to blacklist all of the bad things. One thing to consider, however, is that there are many attack vectors for cross-site scripting, and it's just not the classical tags via URL parameters or form fields. Cross-site scripting can happen wherever user input is included in the website served to the victim. Again, there is no exhaustive list of attack vectors, and new technologies constantly introduce new possibilities to conduct cross-site scripting. Two examples are the G tag and the new formation attribute that was introduced with HTML5. Now let's talk about how to prevent or fix an XSS vulnerability. A lot of times when people talk about XSS, they jump straight to making the output that the attacker provided be data correct which is to say, doing the proper encoding or escaping. But I want to first stop and point out an earlier opportunity to prevent some XSS vulnerabilities. Some types of data always fit a well-known pattern, for example, phone numbers, email addresses, credit card numbers, or social security numbers. If you always refuse incoming data that doesn't match that well-known pattern, you lower the chance that you'll later deliver something like cross-site scripting through your application. If you're not accepting phone numbers that have crazy characters in them, then you won't have to worry about encoding those crazy characters correctly. There are other types of data that you'll receive for which there isn't necessarily a well-known pattern, but you still may have the opportunity to create your own rules for what those might be. For example, usernames or screen names. You might allow spaces to appear in screen names or you might not. You might allow certain types of punctuation to appear in screen names or you might not. Take advantage of the opportunity to define limits on those things early in your application design, before people start using your application, and before you get a wealth of existing data that makes it impossible to retrofit restrictive rules. Your users will live with little certain limitations if they're just limitations at the beginning. It's a lot easier than trying to take away certain tricks that can be used after users have grown to like them. There's one last category of data for which you just have no choice but to allow some of the more strange inputs or dangerous inputs. For example, in the field of a form that accepts a user's last name, people have names like O'Reilly that have an apostrophe in them, and so unfortunately, as much as we might like to enforce a very strict rule about what is a valid name, 
we have no choice but to allow apostrophes as one of the valid characters in last names. Now let's consider data appearing just in HTML. This course is language neutral, so we won't identify specific names of APIs for whether you're working in Java or PHP or .NET or Cold Fusion. Your programming environment should provide you some sort of HTML entity coding API that works basically like what is shown on the screen. Hopefully you can pass a string like the input shown, which notably contains a quote mark, a greater than sign, and an ampersand. And that function should give you back something like what is shown on the screen, where the special characters are entity encoded. If you don't have a function like this in your programming environment, for example, if you're writing things in C and you're developing more of a framework on your own, you might need to roll this yourself. If you do, be sure you're encoding not just less than and greater than signs, but all characters that are not alphanumeric. The reason for this is that if you take a blacklist approach, meaning that you define only certain characters to encode, you will likely miss some attack vectors. But cross-site scripting does not necessarily happen in the HTML context. There are various different contexts in a website, and what makes defending against cross-site scripting so hard is that the different contexts require different encodings. The five most common contexts are HTML element, HTML attribute, JavaScript, CSS, and URL. So, for example, by encoding less than, greater than, and quote, we can defend against many cross-site scripting attacks in the HTML element context, but the attacker does not require those characters in the URL context to successfully exploit cross-site scripting. Incorrect encoding can leave your application open to cross-site scripting attacks or break your website's functionality you need to ensure that your encoder supports different output contexts and that you use them correctly. Let's have a look at an example to see how the correct encoding mitigates cross-site scripting. In this simple PHP example, the parameter username is included in the resulting website. So if a user requests the site with the parameter username John, we expect the site to print Hello John. But as you will already have noticed, this application is vulnerable to reflected cross-site scripting. If the username parameter includes HTML elements, they'll be included in the resulting website and will be interpreted by the browser. In this case, the resulting site will show an alert window. To prevent cross-site scripting while preserving names like O'Reilly, we have to utilize an output encoder, in this case for the HTML element context. A good encoder will ensure that all characters that could be misused in this context are encoded in the context language. For the HTML element context, the dangerous characters like less than, greater than, slash, quote, and so on will be HTML encoded and therefore shown to the user instead of being interpreted by the browser as code. In another example, we can look at user data that is included as part of a URL. Using the same encoding scheme as before will at the least break the resulting link, and it may not even prevent cross-site scripting. Therefore, we have to be sure to use URL encoding in this case. In the case of URLs, an additional countermeasure is to ensure that the resulting URL matches the usual URL pattern, like starting with the protocol identifier, not containing any spaces, etc. By ensuring that every URL has to start with HTTPs, we implicitly make sure that the attacker cannot create a URL starting with JavaScript, as this might again result in a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Again, the recommendation is to use an encoder and ensure that the URL encoding scheme is utilized for the URL context. Sometimes user input is directly included in resulting JavaScript code. For example, if on the server we had some code that was a template web page with JavaScript in it, and the code takes the username parameter from the URL and includes that in the middle of a JavaScript block that is delivered to the client, you would get the result that you see here on the slide. That data on the server shown at the top of the slide would come to the client as script var user equals John between the quotation marks. Here is more to consider regarding JavaScript. Just as with HTML and URL encoding, what would happen if instead of calling it with 
name equals John, we called it with John, quote, semicolon alert, XSS, or some other malicious JavaScript here. Then the data would come back to the user. The page would contain John, quote, semicolon, which the JavaScript interpreter would interpret as ending that statement. And the next part that says alert, XSS, would be interpreted as another JavaScript function call. And if you notice, neither HTML entity encoding nor URL encoding would necessarily save us here. Instead, we need to escape special characters the way JavaScript expects them to be escaped. That means, for example, instead of ending up with foo apostrophe semicolon, which terminates that string, we want to prepend a slash to that apostrophe so that the output HTML contains foo slash apostrophe semicolon. That would allow JavaScript to think that foo slash apostrophe semicolon get hacked was all a part of this string. Now, it would be tempting to just simply do one find replace of apostrophe with slash apostrophe, but if you did that, the attacker would just switch attacks and would start sending foo slash apostrophe. The attacker's slash and your slash would cancel each other out, and we'd be right back where we started, and the attacker would be able to escape outside the boundaries of this string. You have two choices here. You can do a great job of remembering to not only escape the apostrophes, but also escape the other slashes present in the string. And then you have some other risks to worry about, such as whether there's some JavaScript interpreter behavior that we don't know about. Perhaps certain JavaScript interpreters decide that end of line automatically terminates a string, even if there's no apostrophe there. Or there may be some smart quote variant or some other thing. And if you get the implementation totally perfect, yes, you can escape apostrophes and keep data inside strings and it will be all right. This approach can be characterized as safety through perfect implementation, and it is hard to achieve. A better, more resilient approach would be to add the attacker-controlled data into the page in such a way that the attacker's literal apostrophe never appears in the first place, and therefore could never be misconstrued by the JavaScript interpreter to end that string. You could do that by encoding the data into the page as XML, or as Unicode characters by number, using encoding methods like char from code or different options that would avoid putting the attacker-provided data into the page in literal form. This approach is safety by design, and it's much less error-prone. We've learned so far that in order to prevent cross-site scripting, we either need to strip unexpected input where possible, or even better, encode all output according to the destination context. The encoding needs to be done on the server side, as all client-side mechanisms like filtering with JavaScript can be turned off by an attacker. However, you can additionally apply client-side protection to enhance user experience by rejecting characters already while the user is typing, but that cannot replace server-side protection. That said, as the only exception, DOM-based cross-site scripting does not involve the server and therefore it can only be avoided in the targeted JavaScript code on the client side. Try to use existing libraries of your development environment or use well-tested frameworks like OWASP's ESAPI. We've talked about a couple of basic strategies for avoiding cross-site scripting in a pretty comprehensive way, which is to apply input limitations where you can and definitely apply the proper output encoding depending on what context the output is occurring, either in HTML or in a URL, or in the middle of a JavaScript string. Occasionally, people talk about other strategies that they use to avoid XSS in specific circumstances, and is reminiscent of the Perl motto that there's more than one way to do it. Of course, even though there is more one way to do it, only one of them could possibly be the best practice way to do it. So now let's go through a couple of the ways that people sometimes come up with to do XSS mitigation and talk about some of the pitfalls of those. One situation where developers don't want to HTML entity encode all the less than and greater than signs is when they actually want to allow their users to input some HTML. Maybe the developer wants to allow HTML formatting in a profile on a social networking site or in a post on a user forum or something like that. Therefore, they write code that only allows the safe parts of HTML and just strips out any evil HTML that users try to upload. 
So, for example, if you have code that does a find and replace that strips out all of the occurrences of the tag script, then attackers have learned that they can provide input like SCR script IPT, and the find and replace will strip out that script tag in the middle there, and then actually assemble the two halves of another script type for you. And of course, coming up with a rule such as, we will strip out all of the bad tags, begs the question, what are the bad tags? And thanks to cascading style sheets and dynamic HTML techniques, basically every tag is a potentially bad tag. Tags can have event handlers placed on them, like on mouse over, which can trigger JavaScript. They can have positioning and dimension information applied to them, so they take over the entire height and width of the page, which makes sure you're guaranteed to have a mouse over event fire. Even something as simple as allowing people to type in image tags is potentially dangerous, as it gets really difficult to try to validate that people are not only sticking to safe tags, but also only to the safe attributes of those tags. There may also be behaviors of a browser you don't even know about, so you'd have no way to filter them out. There's a reason why popular user review forms built on engines like Ultimate Bulletin Board and PHPBB and others invented different markup systems that look a lot like HTML, but which use square brackets. By doing that, they provide a strict subset of things they want to support, like square bracket B for bold, without having to support any HTML notions like tag attributes of on mouse over or anything like that. Another way to protect against cross-site scripting while still preserving the ability for the user to do some HTML formatting is to use an HTML sanitizer. An HTML sanitizer is aware of the HTML syntax and parses the input into a document object model similarly to what a browser would do. If the input does not result into a valid HTML document, it'll be rejected. Additionally, it allows only specific HTML elements and attributes. All other elements and attributes will be rejected. This can be a secure solution as long as the whitelist is small and does not include exploitable elements. Using output encoding or mechanisms like PHPBB is easier to handle, though. If you need to use HTML sanitizing, you should not create your own solution, as many well-tested frameworks are available for different programming languages. Another common approach that we sometimes see with XSS is that people get used to examples of the very easy XSS holes being parameters that occur right in the URL. It's so easy for an attacker to reach up into the URL and just change those parameters, and people start thinking that it's safer to use data provided via post because that's not so easily manipulated. It's true that means that the attacker has to do something slightly different in order to control the data, but it doesn't actually make it any safer. For example, if I, as an attacker, want you as a victim to post some malicious parameter to the target site, example.com, I will lure you to my web page, and on my web page, I'll put a form such as is shown here. My web page that I've lured you to has a form that's basically invisible. The method of the form is post. It uses a hidden input type, and it passes whatever I need it to pass to the target site to trigger the XSS vulnerability and, for example, steal your identity on the target site. This attack should fire as soon as I lured somebody to the page. Another thing to keep in mind when you're implementing your fixes for XSS is to be sure you're actually fixing the real vulnerability and the real exploit that would actually happen in the real world and not just doing something that blocks the test case. Particularly when you work with somebody who's using an automated tool and maybe doesn't understand all of the intricacies of how the complicated exploit the tool generated works, it's very possible for you to write a fix that only fools the tool, but that does not address the underlying vulnerability. Examples of this type of insufficient mitigation would be to filter on the phrase alert or on the text XSS. If you follow the steps we provide, which include performing HTML entity encoding and input validation, then you have a much better chance of stopping real attacks and not just the test cases. Here's one specific example of stopping the test case without actually stopping the attack that we see sometimes. If you have client-side JavaScript that does input validation on the client-side, you can sometimes fool a tester into thinking you're stopping the attack, 
because the client-side JavaScript blocks the input. This often affects manual testers when they exercise test cases in a browser. What's important to note is that a real attack can always link past any client-side JavaScript. If we go back to our example from a couple of slides ago, if I can lure victims to my website and get them to load my invisible malicious version of the form, my invisible malicious version of the form doesn't have any of the client-side JavaScript-based validation that your nice, well-formed version of the form has. But my malicious form will submit to your same backend that your form does. Thus, I can force people to perform gets or posts to your back end, bypassing any client-side logic your forms may use in your front end. So, you need to be aware that if you add some client-side JavaScript, it might stop a manual tester from being able to get the test done or to reproduce a bug that used to exist. But that's not enough. Do extra work to make sure that even if JavaScript is off, or even if somebody writes a form and puts it on another site, such as we have shown here, and links past your JavaScript client-side validation, that you're still blocking the attack. Cross-site scripting prevention is all about encoding user input. But remember that user input is not just the obvious, like form fields or URL parameters. It can be part of many not-so-expected areas, like cookies, names of uploaded files, HTTP headers, parameter names, not just their values, etc. Also, when loading data from a database, you have to take care even if your application rigorously filters malicious input, there might be other applications that write to the same database and do not perform appropriate filtering. Ensure that all those sources are considered when taking countermeasures against cross-site scripting. Getting cross-site scripting protection right is not trivial, and mistakes happen from time to time. Therefore, it's also important to include cross-site scripting in your testing efforts. There are free and commercial tools that help you detect cross-site scripting and other vulnerabilities in your web application. Intercepting proxies like Zed aid the manual testing, while many other tools make fully automatic scans of the application and try to find as many vulnerabilities as possible. All tools have limitations, though, especially regarding persistent cross-site scripting, where user input and malicious output are in different parts of the application. This slide lists examples of often used tools, but it is not a recommendation for or against any tools listed or not listed. Let's sum up what you've learned today about cross-site scripting. A cross-site scripting vulnerability is like allowing an attacker to upload arbitrary HTML files to your website. The results range from defaced websites to stolen user accounts and your website serving malicious executables. In order to prevent this kind of attack, you have to ensure that user input is validated before it's integrated into websites served to your users. This can optionally be done when the input enters your application. But to more thoroughly prevent cross-site scripting, you need to encode all untrusted data when it's served to the users. The output encoding is difficult to get right if you blacklist potential malicious characters, as the attackers will find ways to conduct cross-site scripting with other characters. Therefore, the best practice is to use well-tested frameworks for your development environments and to ensure that you always encode for the correct context. If you want to learn more about cross-site scripting attack patterns or encoding libraries, you'll find many good resources on the Internet, such as the OWASP.org website. If you want to learn about other web application vulnerabilities, SafeCode provides 101 webinars on other topics, such as injection attacks.